Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and today we are going to talk about what I think is one of the most important issues of our time when it comes to writing, which is artificial intelligence. And we are so lucky to have Martha Brockenbrow here with us today because she is, you'll recognize her name because she was the founder of National Grammar Day. We mention her, you know, every year, but she has gone on to do so many other things. She's written more than 20 books, um, fiction, nonfiction, picture books, you know, for young adults and children. And she has a new book out called Future Tense, How We Made Artificial Intelligence and how it's going to change everything. And it's a, a fabulous, um, it, it's a book for young adults, but I read the whole thing. I thought it was great for such a complicated topic. I appreciated the level that it was at. So Martha, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much for having me. It's great seeing you again. I know you too, it's been a while. I mean, I see you online all the time. <laughs> But, you know, I've been following artificial intelligence closely, I think, for probably about two years. But I can tell from this book that you've been following it a lot longer. It takes a lot more than two years to get a book out. So, you know, what was it all those years ago that led you to realize that artificial intelligence was going to be such an important thing that you wanted to do the vast amount of work that it takes to write a whole book about it? Well, I can connect the dots between Alexander Hamilton and artificial intelligence. So <laughs> here's why. I had just finished a book about Alexander Hamilton um, when Donald Trump won the 2016 election. And I decided at that point to write a book about Trump because it was very clear to me after spending all those years with Hamilton that Trump was the demagogue Alexander Hamilton had predicted and feared. And one of the things that helped Trump gain some power was the influence of bots. And I got really curious about what bots and disinformation and deep fakes and the like might have to do with the erosion of our democracy. And so at that point, it's when it felt really urgent. Um, you know, it's not just a technology that's going to influence our jobs, but also it is one that could potentially allow authoritarian government. And certainly it'll make it harder for us to tell what's true and what's not. So at the at that time, were you aware of sort of the chat bots that people are using now so much to write? Was that on your radar or was that it's... something that came later? Um, that is something my understanding of them came later. I was definitely interested in bots and I have been since, oh my gosh, the mid nineties when I discovered Eliza. Do you remember Eliza? Yes. Yeah. So Eliza was the very first chat bot. She was not artificial intelligence. Her responses, and I say her, um, I should say it because it's really important for us to remember that even though these bots seem real, they are not, they are not thinking, they are responding. So Eliza uh, was the very first one that I became aware of. And Eliza was created by a, a guy, um, Joseph Weizenbaum, who was a German Jewish refugee. And he programmed Eliza to respond. So if you asked, if you had a question or made a statement, Eliza would spawn very respond often with a question to get you to keep talking. And one of the curious effects that he noticed was that people who were well aware that Eliza was just a typewriter programmed to respond felt like they were conversing with someone who was real. Now, when I first started the book, I don't know if chat GPT-1 was a thing, but I had been reading about it, and then I had played around with some iterations on it, like Project December. And so I filed my book. I filed the copy with my editor two years before it came out. And so I was aware of the great significance of these um, large language model um, you know, content generators. Um, but a year ago when they first became really huge is when I, that's kind of when um, 
the first real artificial intelligence that human beings who are just regular people like us could interact with and see what looks like the power. Yeah. So yeah, any, <laughs> the chatbots, really important. So yeah, chatbots are so such a leap forward. And you were talking about anthropomorphizing, though, thinking that these are human. I know, you know, I anthropomorphize my Roomba. You know, it's just human nature to to want, I don't know, it's something in us that reacts to things that are interacting with us that way. So yeah, we have to be so careful to remember that the AI that we're interacting with isn't sentient. It isn't talking with us to us. And that's my dog. I have I have three cats here and one dog and I'm I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, the cat get the dogs all worked up? A little bit. Oh. Uh, so, uh, yes, we have to remember that they're not sentient. And it is true. I mean, they even invite us to name our robot vacuums. And you can name your phone and all these devices. And it's cute and it's fun. It does reveal that we human beings are wired to connect. We're also wired to believe. Mm -hmm. And so this, and, and there are advantages to believing what you're told and to trusting people. We can really form our, our civilization without it, could we? Yeah. And so, some, you know, add something that's not sentient into the mix. And what are the possibilities? Yeah. You know, I've likened AI to the um, development of the internet or sometimes the car because it has the, you know, the internal combustion engine because it has so much potential to upend not not only society, but also has impacts on the environment because of the huge amount of energy usage. But you've compared it to electricity. And I think that is also like probably a better analogy. So explain like why you why you think it's like the development of electricity. Well, think about how many things have, you know, electricity wired into them. There's all of our lights. There's all of our appliances. Anything that you plug in is a tool that becomes that much more powerful because of the electricity running through it. So, yes, remember when you had phones before there was artificial intelligence and they might have seemed smart, but you couldn't say, hey, Siri, and get an answer to the question that you were hoping to get an answer to. And so, yes, um, that is electricity takes tools and makes them more powerful. AI will take tools and make them more powerful. And what we have to make sure that we're not going to do, if I'm not torturing the metaphor, is stick a fork in the outlet. <laughs> yeah, well, I know, you know, I know writers who use and love AI and I know other writers who will, you know, virtually spit on you if you say you have, if you mention using AI, you know, talk, can you talk a little bit about the issues that, that come up and, and the feelings maybe about AI in the writing and editing world? Yes. So let's start with how those tools are trained. The ones that generate text or generate images, those have all been trained on stolen material. There is no way to use those to generate anything and have it be ethical. And I'm sorry that that's the case, but that's just what it is. There are other kinds of AI that writers can use that are not trained on stolen material and that are not developed with stolen material so that people don't have to pay for those skills. Uh, and it's funny because Mark Andreessen, who was the founder of Netscape, the first uh, internet browser, said, well, if we have to pay for that, then it makes, you know, we will make much less profit. And yes, boodly who, Mark Andreessen, if you have to pay for things, you make less profit. And that is how those of us who live in the real world and have to pay for our pens and pencils and all of our internet service providers, you know, that's just how business works. You don't get to say, well, we could make a lot of profit with the stolen stuff. So um, if you are using it to generate text that you plan to go on using, just know that you're putting other writers and yourself out of business. Now, 
um, AI that doesn't use this, there's a tool that I think is very interesting called authors.ai. And you can upload a completed manuscript novel and it will look at the underlying mathematical relationships in your text. So novels are patterns. You know, there's pacing, there's the overall shape of the story, there's the sentence length, uh, there's the word choices. All of these extremely complex patterns that go into the creation of a novel, you can look at the underlying math. And so you can see the chart of the pacing of your novel. And I think that's interesting. It doesn't fix the pacing for you. You have to do it yourself. But it's like having a friend who's really good at pacing say, hey, this part at around page you know, 30 is very saggy, and you can fix that. Uh, I do think there are some ethical ways to use the large language model generators, so chat GPT and BARD and, and that. And that is when, um, for example, let's say you're working on a novel and you type a synopsis of the novel and say, help me find the save the cat beats or the hero's journey beats. And those are um, sections of a novel or points in, in a story that are meaningful. Um, and it can help you do that in a not, you know, it's pretty good at it um, because it knows what the hero's journey is, having stolen it. Um, it knows what Save the Cat is, having stolen it. Um, and so you can help, you know, uh, be insightful that way. There's another ethical use. My daughter is dyslexic. And so when she writes something, one of the things that can be hard for people with dyslexia is all of the proofreading and the mechanics, the things that make um, the fans of Grammar Girl go wild. She puts her text into the large language model and asks it to correct for grammar and usage, and it will do that for her. And it's pretty good. If you don't have a problem with spell check or grammar check in your word processing software, then... Um, you know, this is essentially the same thing, but for people like my daughter is a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm just a little confused. So, you know, the, the talk you talk about it being unethical to use it for writing because it's built on stolen material, but it's all built on stolen material. So if it's ethical to use it for, you know, fancy spell check, grammar check, you know, why wouldn't it be ethical to use it for writing? Um, okay. So... Generating writing is different from asking someone to proofread your paper. It's like, it's the difference between buying a paper. Remember when you could do that in college, buy an essay? Sure. Uh, <laughs> I heard, I actually heard that ChatGPT is putting all those companies out of business that sell essays. <laughs> right, right. You're not going to be able to sell essays anymore. Um, and so that was never ethical. That was never okay. And if you're, I suppose, if you say, hey, I used ChatGPT to write this sonnet for you or to, um, you know, write this marketing copy, if you've disclosed it, okay, it's ethical. Um, in terms of um, stealing, so the copies that author AI used of the text um, those are all legally obtained mm -hmm. because, you know, if I go to the library, um, if I type up something, I can do that. It's legal. It's not prohibited in the use of the book. What's different about the generative tools is that they are taking the training and they are generating new material from it. So you could say, all right, Julia Quinn, author of the Bridgertons, brilliant romance novelist, fan of grammar, um, you could train something strictly on her style and be able to generate in the style of Julia Quinn. That's not what her books are sold to do. They're, you know, they are sold to be read and enjoyed. Um, you can study them as a writer, but to then be able to take that and create something in place of a person, that feels pretty sketchy to me. Yeah, I hate that idea, like whether it's AI or not. It's one thing, you know, writers learn to write by reading very often. Um, and that's where, you know, many of us have internalized rules of language and grammar from reading because that's how our brains work. Our brains are extraordinary pattern recognition engines. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, what is grammar but a description of the patterns of language? And so we're, we're really good at recognizing these patterns. Um, all artists and writers learn by copying the patterns that they've seen, but they're also putting in their own human effort there. Um, and, you know, we know that plagiarism is bad. Um, you know, certainly you can't be a Harvard professor, even or, or president rather, with even the mildest um, <laughs> versions of unattributed work when the mob comes for you. Um, but, you know, there's a difference between training yourself and having the output, you know, inform just your work versus, um, you know, being able to produce something without the labor um, that, you know, mm-hmm. machines did. Mm-hmm. It's it's just a very different yeah. kind of yeah. process. I mean, I know editors who are worried about the kind of um, thing that your daughter's doing, that that sort of tool is going to put editors out of work. But actually talking about plagiarism is a super uh, transition into um, another question we that we had from a grammar Pelusian. Um, the people who support the show are called grammar Pelusians. A grammar Pelusian named uh, Linda said that a lot, she works at a school and a lot of the teachers at her school are very concerned that students will just use AI, ChatGPT and the like to produce their work instead of writing it themselves. Um, and I, I know that the um, detect the AI detectors that a lot of schools are using are terrible and are flagging things that aren't AI. You know, what are your thoughts on, you know, how to teach students writing when they have this very tempting tool right there that can do the work for them? It's such a great question. And teachers are so good at figuring out solutions to things. You know, if I were still teaching high school, I would have my students write in class Mm -hmm. um, and hand it in at the end. Also, one of the amazing things that uh, ChatGPT does is generate nonsense and hogwash that seems real and so let the students you know go through something that's been written by one of these tools and find the errors in it find the hallucinations i love this name for it so when something is entirely made up like um a court case citation several lawyers have have tried to use chat gpt uh to generate documents to present to judges and have found oops there was no such case that chat gpt mentioned and so um, i would absolutely have students read these things and correct them and figure out like how do they know that the large language model has um, given them good information because you know there's lots of false stuff that is on the internet to begin with and then you know, as long as this court case sounds like the pattern of other court cases, it's going to be perfectly acceptable in the non-sentient mind of chat GPT, but in the real world, absolutely not. And this is one of the most powerful things and one of the most important things teachers can be working on is showing students you cannot trust what comes from these sources. Right. So so teachers can have their students write in class a lot, obviously, but in, you know, they can't always do that. So do you have any advice on how to how to motivate students, I guess, to I guess you have to motivate them to want to do the work themselves because they're always going to be able to turn to this tool and we're probably never going to be able to detect to detect if they have. So what's the message to give to students to motivate them to do their own work? It's a really good question, and each student is different, and many of them are very motivated. Um, One of the problems that we have is putting so much pressure on students that they feel that they can get better results if they don't actually do the work themselves. So parents, reduce the pressure on your kids. (laughs) Um, You know, teachers too. It's it's, uh, Nobody likes to perform when they're under that kind of pressure all the time. Second thing is how to make it interesting to students. You know what's not interesting is, well, this is my own, this is my own pet peeve about how we teach history and how we teach, um, you know, the art of, of reading fiction. Nobody writes books, nobody writes stories so that someday some poor child might have to write a five paragraph essay about them. <laughs> And likewise, you know, nonfiction is meant to 
you know, inform you, to fill you with a sense of wonder. Um, those are really good emotional experiences for kids. And if we can make the, the response as interesting emotionally as the source material is, then, you know, I think we're going to be in really good shape. And so have students write letters to characters or have them um, come up with advertising slogans for technology that was invented in the past that calls out, you know, that things that demonstrate their understanding, but don't feel like the grind that we so often make our kids endure. And what about using AI as a tool for writing as a partner to, you know, evaluate points you've missed or to brainstorm topic ideas or, you know, I mean, I think everyone agrees it's not good for them to just generate their, as it says, out of a whole cloth. But I think that this, whether you like it or not, this technology is here. It's going to be in the workplace. It's it's going to be in our lives, like you said, like electricity. So what about teaching them to sort of use it in a, a way that isn't plagiarism and, or, and unethical, like however you want to describe it, we can agree that it's bad, but but it's still going to be there and they're going to have to use it in the future, I think. Oh, absolutely. In the same way, remember, you know, going to the library to research things and using the card catalog or going to, what was it? Like the, there was that, I can't even remember what it was. Like The this, microfiche? Um, there, were, there was microfiche, but also there was a, um, there were these books that had, you know, summaries of everything that had been in magazines and you could go mm-hmm. see, oh, oh, you know, anyway, it used to be a lot harder to get information. And we've certainly, the internet has made it way easier. Um, and we've taught students how to evaluate the sources. So really what we're wanting to do is scaffold these human beings Um, as they develop skills that they're going to depend on for their lives. Writing and critical thinking, those are the most important academic skills there are. And so if they're using it to refine their points or what did I miss, that's totally appropriate scaffolding. Where it's not is when students stop thinking. And so the whole goal of all of these things is to get our students to use their minds and to be able to focus and make connections and from their observations and the connections they've made, make powerful arguments that will tilt whatever corner of the world they're in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I think, you know, to finish up, this gets to Linda's question too. The, a line that I highlighted as I was reading in future tense was about teachers losing their jobs to AI And you seem especially concerned about that. Can you talk about sort of what you think the risks are? I'm absolutely concerned about that. We have teachers who are wildly underpaid and grossly overworked. And so, you know, what is the solution that capitalism is going to come up with for that? Well, it's to reduce their numbers. And, you know, every sentence in this book was written in the context of how does capitalism plus AI affect humanity? It's a very, very bad combination. Um, Capitalism says profit is good. And the number one way to boost profits is to um, cut your workforce or make people do more with less. And so this is absolutely going to affect teachers. It's going to affect our students. There are going to be ways that AI could be useful in classrooms, um, you know, for quick assessments or understanding, you know, things like math. There's steps to math problems. And if you don't do the steps in the order, you're not going to get them. And so if you have little tools that help kids, you know, nudge them um, until they have internalized the patterns of those steps and are proficient, Sure. Um, But I am extremely concerned that um, the very important job of teaching is going to be hard hit um, by these technologies that people say will make everything so much better. And they really don't. Human beings learn when there are human connections being made, um, when they feel safe, when they feel valued, when they feel interested. Um, and I don't see that putting our children in front of a screen um, 
is going to accomplish any of that. Right. Yeah. You know, I posted something the other day about there was an AI tutor that was launched and it it gave kids the wrong answers. Um, not all the time. Like it was it was, you know, 98, 99 percent, no, you know, like up there in accuracy. But it occasionally gave wrong answers and, you know, everyone was making fun of it. And um, I was joining in on the making fun of it. And um, but like some people came back and said, well, Okay, teachers make mistakes too. So no, you know, I, I've certainly heard stories of teachers telling kids the wrong thing. So neither of them are perfect. And wouldn't the world be great if every student had a dedicated tutor that was always there to answer questions? You know that that these AI tutors were would actually make things so much better. And, and I mean, it was a it was an interesting point. Um, I'm just not sure. You know, honestly, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Like, what do you? Th think about that. I would I would flip it. I would hate to have a tutor who answers questions. Um, I used to be a high school journalism teacher. And one of the reasons that I quit was that the people who ran the school wanted me as the advisor to have the last say over what went in the newspaper. And I said, as soon as you give me the last say, the students are going to stop thinking. And I am here to support their thinking and to then help them through the consequences of their thinking and their writing. So if you've got a tutor and a student is asking a question and the tutor answers it, um, what you have taught the student is that the tutor is the source of answers. Um, and we definitely don't want that. Imagine, I mean, let's, let's you know, whip out our tools of fiction. You've got a tutor that is deliberately misinforming a student, teaching them things like there was no moon landing, you know, the <laughs> shadows are wrong. You know, it could happen. Um, what is that movie with Matthew McConaughey and Anne Hathaway in it? Um, it's the one where they go off into space. Um, and anyway, fantastic movie. I, for whatever reason, can't remember the name of it. Um, but one of the things, the textbooks in that film have been um, edited to show things like the moon landing never happened. Mm -hmm. And so um, we have a problem with misinformation and disinformation in this country already. Um, we also have a large population of people who think that doing your research means Googling it. Um, <laughs> research, especially scientific research. Google's gotten um, a lot worse lately too. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. But, uh, the, you know, it's, that's not research. And yeah. so if you have a tutor who's asking questions, then it becomes more interesting. All of a sudden, we've got a little Socratic mentor, you know, our, mm -hmm. our digital Socrates, I Socrates, um, who's there. And that could be interesting. Um, but again, you know, do kids need instant feedback or is part of the struggle in not knowing and having to wrestle it and having to deal with the emotional discomfort of uncertainty? Um, we cannot optimize every human process because in the end, we are all made of meat. We are all these cells and they work in a certain way. And the best way to make a new neural connection is through play. It takes repetition and neural connections are made more quickly through play than other forms. And so if we really want to help kids learn and if we really want to help ourselves have more joy in life, the question is how can we be more playful? So if these tools are gamifying things, um, I'm interested. If they are just answering questions, I am horrified. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that that sums up how I feel about AI. I am both very interested and very horrified at times. So I think that's a good place to end. Um, thank you so much, Martha, for being here. The book, again, is Future Tense, How We Made Artificial Intelligence and How It Will Change Everything. And I will tell you, it is a great book. If you want to get up to speed on both the history and where things currently are with AI, it's just it's it's expansive. This book, it's clear and expansive. So I highly recommend it if you're looking to get up to speed on AI. 
Um, Martha, you also do school and library visits and host writers retreats. I saw that on your website. So where, where's the best place for people to find you? MarthaBrokenBro.com is a good place. But if you want to see cat pictures, I'm on Twitter as, or sorry, on Instagram as Martha B E E, Martha B. Martha B. Well, thanks yeah. so much again for being here, Martha B. Thank you. It's so good to see you again and uh, have a great day. You too.